Tabaot ladies, Bochot and Nimzaot, and to the viewers also of Torah Anytime, the ones who are logging in and finding the time just several days before the auspicious night of the Laila Seder, and you're managing to find the time to log on and to listen to Shirei Torah, Ashrechem, Ashrechem to all the ladies out there and you who ventured out tonight regardless of the cleaning and the cooking and getting everything ready for the Chag. And we have a lot of work to do before the great auspicious day. And I decided I'm gonna give the shiur sitting down myself because um, after the things that I've learned regarding what I'm gonna teach you, I felt I gotta sit down for this one. So you are sitting Baruch Hashem and I'm sitting Baruch Hashem. We're good to go. I just want to make mention of something very important. I want to thank two ladies who wanted to remain anonymous. You know, uh, there are four times a year that we try to collect tzedakah. The four famous times we collect tzedakah for our organization, for the good work that we do around Rosh Hashanah time, and then Hanukkah and Inyan to give tzedakah, Purim, and Pesach, Kimcha de Pischa. Now, uh, obviously, I didn't mention anything this time because I had already asked Purim and I felt embarrassed to ask again. I didn't want it to seem as if I'm only asking and asking and asking for funds. But I have to say, I have to thank two ladies who made donations this week. And they wrote on the bottom as a notation that they're giving towards Pesach. Now I didn't ask, I did not ask, but I felt it was so nice of them that I didn't have to ask. They just, they realized probably we're collecting and they, and they sent anyway. So I want to thank those two ladies who wanted to remain anonymous. You know who you are. Thank you so, so, so much for thinking about us, for thinking about these other ladies or other families and that we didn't have to ask you, Ashrechem. May you be blessed with all the berachot and yeshuot. Ladies, tonight is a very special class because this coming Shabbat, the Shabbat before Pesach, is called Shabbat HaGadol. Now, there are many reasons as to why this Shabbat is called Shabbat HaGadol. Some Chachamim explain that in the olden days, the Gadol Hador, the great uh, leader, of the community delivered a powerful shiur to all of the Jewish people. That's one reason why it was called Shabbat HaGadol. But in the Shulchan Aruch, Shabbat HaGadol is mentioned, and we're told that it's called Shabbat HaGadol mipnei hanes shena asabo, because of the miracle that took place on that day. Interestingly, the Shulchan Aruch doesn't tell us what the miracle was, but we can acquire the information from the great Tur, Alav Shalom Rabbi Yaakov Balaturim, who explains that in the year that Am Yisrael were going to leave Egypt, HaKadosh Baruch Hu commanded them to take a sheep, to tie it to their bedposts, and that sheep was supposed to be slaughtered four days later and used for the Korban Pesach. They were commanded to take this sheep on the 10th of Nisan, which happened to have been a Shabbat in that year. Now, the Egyptians saw the Jews taking the sheep, and you have to bear in mind that the Egyptians worshipped the sheep like a god. So they asked the Jews, why are you taking these sheep? What are you going to do with it? And the Jews answered them honestly. They said, we're taking the sheep because God commanded us to take the sheep. And in a few days from now, we're going to slaughter it and we're going to bring it up as a korban to the one and true God, the creator of Shamayim Va'aretz. Now you could imagine how upset the Egyptians were when they heard this because the Jews were pretty much telling them, we're going to take your God and we're going to slaughter your God and we're going to bring it up as a sacrifice to the real God. When the Egyptians heard this, they wanted to kill the Jews on the 10th of Nisan, which was... Uh, Shabbat. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu made a miracle and on that day that they were supposed to kill us HaKadosh Baruch Hu caused their bodies to have some kind of reaction 
and they all ran away. So 3,000 years later, we still celebrate this miracle that happened on the 10th of Nisan, which was Shabbat. Even though the 10th of Nisan doesn't always fall out on Shabbat, but we celebrate this miracle that happened to the Jews on Shabbat all those years ago. We celebrate on the Shabbat before Chag Pesach. This is Shabbat Hagadol. It was a big miracle. Now we said earlier that the Shulchan Aruch uh, mentions Shabbat Hagadol as the Shabbat before Pesach. And we're told that we celebrate it due to the great miracle that took place on that day. But what practical lesson am I supposed to learn from that historical fact? What are me and you supposed to learn from that? As a side note, by the way, the Chida, Alav Shalom, or Bichayim Yosef David Azulai says that the reason the Shulchan Aruch mentioned Shabbat HaGadol is because when you greet your friend on the street on that Shabbat, now coming up this Shabbat, you shouldn't just say Shabbat Shalom or Good Shabbos. You should say Shabbat HaGadol Shalom. You have to use the word Hagadol to your greeting. Why? Says the Chida. Because the Shulchan Aruch wants us to remember that this Shabbat is so important to the extent that if you greet someone on the street, you have to add the word Hagadol in order to remind yourself of how great the Shabbat really is. So if you greet anybody on the streets or in shul this coming Shabbat, you wish them Shabbat Hagadol Shalom, or in the Ashkenazic lingo, you could wish them a, a, a Git Shabbos Hagadol. <laughs> Ladies, I want to discuss this miracle that took place for the Jews in Egypt just four days before they left. Because interestingly, from that time in Egypt, there was no time in history where the Jews slaughtered the Korban Pesach, like the Jews did in Egypt. During the times of the Bet HaMikdash, you brought the Korban Pesach, but you didn't have to take the sheep and tie it to the bedpost and do all the formalities that the Jews did in Mitzrayim. So it seems that all the things the Jews did in Egypt, all those, uh, the protocol that had to take place, it was like a, a once in a lifetime event. It never happened again after that. Of course, we brought a Korban Pesach years later, Bet HaMikdash, but it wasn't done in the same way that the Jews did in Egypt. During the times of the Bet HaMikdash, you just took a sheep, you went to Yerushalayim, and you slaughtered it, and that's that. The question is, why? If we weren't going to go through the same rituals that our ancestors did uh, in Egypt all those years ago, then why did we still have to bring the Korban Pesach four days before Pesach? like they did on the 10th of Nisan. Why can we bring it uh, the day before Pesach? Or better yet, why not on the day of Pesach, Erev Pesach? Ladies, there's an amazing ma'amar from a great rabbi called the Torah Chaim, Shalom, who discusses the entire episode of Yetziat Mitzrayim, the exodus of Egypt, from Egypt. And in order to teach us about the wonders of Yetziat Mitzrayim, the Torah Chaim quotes the Gemara of Chulin. Now, what's fascinating about this Gemara is that the Gemara itself is not addressing Yetziat Mitzrayim, but rather the dreams that the butler, the Sar Hamashkim, had when he was in prison with Yosef HaTzadik. Oh. Ladies, tonight, you and I are about to journey into the world of what we call the ethereal world, the mystical world, because I couldn't believe, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, Shabbat HaGadol, Yetziat Mitzrayim, the butler's dream, what in heaven's name? So let's go back to Parashat Vayeshev for a moment, which is where these dreams take place, where the dream takes place. What does the butler see in his dream? He sees a geffen in front of him, and then he sees three branches. Then, suddenly, the branches grow grapes. He also sees himself holding paro's 
royal goblet in his hand and he sees the grapes in his hand. He squeezes the grapes into Paro's cup and then he sees himself putting the cup of wine into Paro's palm. This was his dream in a nutshell. And the Gemara comments on this dream. The Gemara asks, what was this geffen that the butler saw in his dream? Rav Yomiya Bar Abba, Alava Shalom, answers, Elu Yisrael. The geffen is referring to Am Yisrael. That's interesting, because we always thought that the butler was dreaming about himself. We thought the dream was about how the butler is going to be reinstated into Pao's palace as the wine uh, bearer and pour wine for Pao all over again. And that's how Yosef HaTzadik interpreted the dream. But the Gemara comes along and says, no, no, it's not exactly that way. The Gemara tells us that if Yosef HaTzadik heard the dream of the butler, it's not only for the sake of the butler that he heard it. But that dream has something to do with Yosef and Bnei Israel. How? In this dream, the butler saw three branches. The Gemara tells us that those three branches represent the Shalosha, the Shalosh Regalim, the three main pil pilgrimages to Yerushalayim in each year that we take, Sukkot, Pesach, and Shavuot. So in the butler's dream, we already have a prediction about Pesach. Now the butler also uh, saw grapes that began to grow on those branches. And the Gemara says that the grapes represented the idea that It came time for the Jewish people to multiply and to flourish. And that's why in Parashat Shemot it says, Uvene Israel paru v'yishretzu v'yirbu. The Jewish people began to multiply in great abundance. Moving on, the Gemara says that when the butler dreamt that the branches and the grape reached their blossom, what did that mean? It meant, Higia zmanam shel Yisrael lehigael. It came time for Am Yisrael to be redeemed from Egypt. Ladies, if you think about it, this is an amazing Gemara. When we read about the butler's dream, we don't see a trace of what the Gemara is implying about Yitziat Mitzrayim and that Geffen represents Kal Yisrael and the, the Geula. When the Rabbanim and the Gemara read the Sarah Mashkim's dream, they see an unbelievable prediction. They see the Geffen as Bnei Yisrael. They see the three branches in the dream as the Shalosh Regalim that are going to be instituted in the future. They see the multiplication of Bnei Yisrael in this dream and they see the Geulah from Mitzrayim in the dream. Ladies, we read the butler's dream hundreds of times when we were in elementary school, when we were in high school, and we understood it at face value. We always thought that this dream had nothing to do with us and it was a personal dream concerning the Sarah Mashkim. But the Gemara tells us no. The butler's dreams has ramifications concerning Bnei Israel and their future. And this is something that Yosef understood as well. We'll talk about that soon. So based on this amazing Gemara, the Holy Torah Chaim begins his incredible Ma'amar where he explains the events of Yetziat Mitzrayim. He discusses the cup of wine that the butler saw in the dream that was in his hand. It says, Vekos paro beyadi. The cup of paro was in my hand. What does the Torah Chaim say about that cup of wine? He says, Mikan kavu chachamim arba kosot shel Pesach keneged arba kosot shenemu kan. Oh, the Gemara teaches us that if you analyze the butler's dream, the word kos is mentioned four times. And from this dream, 
Chachamim decided to institute the minhag of drinking the Arba Kosot on the night of the Seder. Now, I'm amazed because when we were in elementary school, we learned that the four cups are connected the four Lashonot, the four languages used of the Geula, uh, Vehotseti, um, Vehitzalti, Vegaalti, Velakarti. And we're not minimizing the four expressions that define the Geula, but the Gemara is telling us that there is a deeper reason as to why we drink those four cups of wine. We're being told that we drink four cups of wine because in the Sar Hamashkin's dream, he mentioned the Kos four times. Now, did he really mention the Kos four times? For all of you out there who uh, have doubts about whether or not the Gemara is uh, in the Torah, Tachayim knows what he's talking about. Let's see. I have it written down here. The first time. Vekos Pao Beyadi. That's the first time that the Kos is mentioned. Vaishatotam El Hakos is the second time it's mentioned where the grapes were squeezed into the cup. Vaitanita Kos El Kaf Pao is the third time that it's mentioned where the butler puts the cup in Pao's hand. And then Yosef begins to interpret the butler's dream. And while he's interpreting it, it says, Venateta kos pao beyado. That's the fourth time the cup is mentioned, where Yosef tells the butler that he's going to be reinstated as the Saamashkin. So although it's Yosef who mentions the fourth kos, uh, but that fourth kos was already part of the interpretation of the butler's dream, and the dream and the interpretation go hand in hand, as Chachamim explained it. It was part of the entire dream interpretation as well. And uh, Chachamim say it was even deeper than that. It was part of the entire prophecy of Klal Yisrael embedded in that dream. If you think about it, it's incredible. The four kosot that we drink are connected the four kosot of the butler. I find it fascinating because it's such an irrelevant connection to the Chachim and the Geulah. What in the world is this all about? Why do I have to drink four cups of wine on Pesach because of some dream that an Egyptian butler had 3,000 years ago? I mean, think about it. If someone got up on the night of the Seder and said, uh, Kadesh, everybody please raise your cup because uh, this cup represents the first course of the butler in Egypt. Uh, we think the guy already had uh, four kosot. <laughs> the guy's drunk. What kind of craziness is this? What does the Saham Mashkim have to do with the night of the Seder Bechlal? Not only that, but the other three kosot that follow also have to do with the uh, Saham Mashkim. The first kos, Kadesh, and everything. Since when does the Egyptian butler receive such kavod on the night of the Seder? Toat Chaim asks this question. What does the redemption of Am Yisrael in Egypt have to do with the dream of the Sa'a Mashkin? Not only that, but from this butler's dream, the Chachamim instituted the Alba Kosot of Pesach. What's the connection? Says the Toat Chaim. I'm going to read you his uh, Lashon. Lefi she'aya nigzar l'Yisrael, שיהיו משובדים במצרים ארבע מאות ושלושים שנה. When it comes to the redemption, says the Torah Chaim, there are a few numbers that are spoken of, of. We all know that the number 210 is the actual number of years that Bnei Israel were in Egypt. We also heard the number 400. And now there's another number that's uh, added to the list where we're told that they were supposed to be there for 430 years. Not only that, but Chachamim tell us that the actual Avodat Parech, the intense labor, was for a period of 86 years. Many Rabbanim struggle to reconcile all these numbers because, well, which number is the real number? Is it 86 years? Is it 210 years, 400 years, or 430 years? What's the real number? Well, we know that it was uh, really 210 years. They were there for 210 years. But if that's the case, how could the Torah say that we were going to be there for 430 years? So the Torah Chaim explains 
that the Jews were slaves for only one-fifth of the time that was decreed upon them. In actuality, the gzera of the slavery was 430 years. And one-fifth of 430 years is 86 years. 86 was the number of years that their work as slaves was intensified. So, uh, uh, for lack of a better uh, term, there was a kind of like an 80% discount that was given to the Jewish people. We were supposed to be slaves for Pao in Egypt for 430 years, and we worked as slaves for only 86 years. And then the Torah Chaim tells us the following. Listen to what he says. And then the Torah Chaim tells us the following. He says, it's well known that the dreams of the butler and the baker, they were godly dreams. They came from Hashem. These dreams were not for the sake of the butler or the baker. These weren't personal dreams. The other Akadosh Baruch Hu wanted to inform Yosef HaTzadik, who was listening to these dreams, as to what the future holds for Klal Yisrael. And Yosef was supposed to understand exactly how these dreams pertain to him and Am Yisrael. As a result of that, that would prompt him to make certain adjustments in the Egyptian government in order to ensure that these dreams come true for the sake of Am Yisrael. Do you hear this? Now, how is the butler's dream going to be secured? How is the prophecy going to be safeguarded? Listen to the words of the Torah Chaim. He says, The ikar halomo lo ba ela bishvilo. The main reason for the butler's dream was for Yosef, not for the butler. Now, when Yosef hears the butler's dream, he hears the word kos. That wasn't the word that the Torah generally used to refer to a goblet. If you remember the story of Yosef and the brothers and Benjamin, who uh, was accused of stealing the royal goblet, the word gavia was used. That was the terminology used in Egypt. A goblet was a gavia. But in the butler's dream, Yosef hears the word kos, and he hears that word four times. So Yosef started to analyze this idea. Why was the word kos mentioned four times? Says the Torah Chaim. Ela lehodiyo, kol hakorot sheyavo leYisrael hanimshalim lagefen. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to inform Yosef of all the events that would transpire concerning Am Yisrael who are compared to a grapevine, to Geffen. Liot Meshubadim Lepar'o HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted Yosef to know that Bnei Yisrael are going to be slaves to Par'o. Ladies, what do you do with grapes? You crush them, you smash them, and you squeeze them. And that's what was going to happen to Am Yisrael. Vayeschat. The grapes that are a reference to Am Yisrael are going to be pressed. Vayeschat. And Yosef understood that this was an omen concerning the pressures and the intensity of, of Klal Yisrael's slavery in Egypt. It wasn't going to be easy for the Jewish people. Vehakol yehiyu dosim alehim. And the Egyptians are going to trample on them. However, says the Torah Chaim, After this intense period of slavery, they're going to rise to very high levels of Kedusha. Am Yisrael is going to be raised to the level of kings, just like the Pasuk says in the butler's dream. After the butler squeezed the grapes in the kos, what does the Pasuk say? He put the cup in Pao's palm. So Am Yisrael was going to be reinstated in front of the king. That means that after all the suffering in Egypt, they're going to rise to levels of Malchut. 
ואתם תהיו ממלכת כהנים וגוי קדוש. After all that pain and suffering, הקדוש ברוך הוא was going to raise us to the great heights of priesthood and we'd become the holiest nation on the earth. So when Yosef heard the word kos four times during the course of the butler's dream, שבא להודיעה מהירות הקץ, says the Torah Chaim. Hashem was informing Yosef of how quickly the geula is going to manifest itself. Hashem was telling him the geula is going to come a lot faster than you think. Because the word kos in gematria is equal to 86. And four kosot, 86 times four, is equal to 344. Therefore, kos, 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 kos is a siman that the geula is going to be expedited. The geula is going to take place 344 years before the gzera of the 430 years that we were supposed to be slaves. Wasn't that the words of the Torah Chaim? Lefi shehakos, remez leyeshua. A kos is always a hint to some salvation. When you see the word kos, that's what David HaMelech, Allah Shalom, wrote in Sefer Tehilim. Kos yeshuot esa. So every time Yosef heard the word kos, ah, he knew it was a hint, a remez, to a salvation. He thought to himself, a, a kos or oh, oh, minus 86 years of the slavery, because kos equals 86. Oh, another kos? Oh, another 86 is going to be taken away from B'nai Israel's bondage in Egypt. A, another, a third kos? Uh, minus another 86. And the Torah Chaim says you can imagine the happiness that Yosef felt when he heard the butler's dream because growing up in Yaakov Avinu's house meant that he knew that the Jews were going to be slaves for 430 years. But here HaKadosh Baruch Hu is informing him that there's going to be a reduction on this terrible decree. The Jews were going to have a geula sooner than later. You see, Yosef knew about the slavery in Egypt because that's something that his uh, family spoke about all the time. They all knew that the Jews were going to be slaves for 430 years. But then Yosef hears the words, kos, 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 and his heart starts to jump from joy. Kos means a Yeshua. And four kosot means that the 430 year long galut is going to be reduced to an 86 year sentence of intense labor. But what's the purpose of Yosef knowing this? Unless HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted Yosef to activate certain principles in Egypt even before Am Yisrael was going to come down. For example, one of the things that Yosef did in Egypt is that he exempted the Egyptian priests from being taxed. Uh, this is what's called a clergy exemption. And Chachamim are baffled by this. Why did Yosef do this? What, did he like the Egyptian priests so much that he wanted to provide a freebie for them? If it was me, I'd tax them three times the amount, the because what do you think these Egyptian priests preached about to Paro all day? They said, kill the Jews, kill the babies, kill the boys, throw them in the... So these are the people you want to offer a tax reduction to, a tax break? But Yosef had a very logical reason for this. You see, once it was written in the ledgers of Egypt that the clergymen were exempt from paying taxes, as much as Paro disliked the Jews, he had to uphold this law, and he didn't force the priests in Am Yisrael, which was Shevet Levi, to pay taxes either. And as a result of the financial relief, Shevet Levi was able to devote itself uh, uh, to devote most of their time to the study of Torah. So this move on Yosef's part was a political move that was done for the sake of the Jewish people, not the Egyptian priests. By exempting the Egyptian priests from paying taxes, 
That ensured that in the future, it would protect Shevet Levi, who were the uh, learners of Am Yisrael during the uh, slavery in Egypt. That's one action that uh, Yosef took for the sake of Am Yisrael. But uh, he did something else also that was a, a little strange. It seems from the Psukim in the Torah that he turned Egypt into a communistic country. How? Well, he told the citizens of Egypt, from now on, all the lands belong to the state. He provided the Egyptians with seeds, and he asked them to cultivate the land. And then he issued a command that from that produce that grows in the land, one-fifth should be given to Pao. Why does the Torah HaKadoshah give me this information? That Yosef passed a law in Egypt that the government gets 20% of a citizen's produce and the people get to keep 80% of their profits. Now the Torah, we know, doesn't usually provide unnecessary information. So why does it go out of its way to provide me with the tax code that Yosef instituted in Egypt, 20% citizens, 80% uh, uh, sorry, opposite, 20% Pao, 80% citizens. Why is this information about the taxes in Egypt so relevant for me now? The Torah Chaim says that this move on Yosef's part wasn't only economical, it was historical. Because at this point in our story, Yosef heard the butler's dream and he knows the real interpretation. He knows about Am Yisrael and about the upcoming slavery in Egypt. He also knows that there's going to be an 80% discount on the 430 year decree. And he knows that Pao isn't going to be too happy about that discount. So Yosef has to create what the Gemara calls Dina de Malchuta Dina. The law of the land is the law. What does he do? He passes a law that's documented in Pao's ledger that the law of the land is that if someone owes the government, all he has to pay is 20% and he's exempt from the rest. That's the law in Egypt. By creating this law, Yosef was securing Am Yisrael's early release from Egypt because the Egyptians can't come along and contest the expedited geulah. They can't say, listen here, you owe us 430 years of slavery and you're leaving now 344 years too early. They can't say that now because the law of the land was that 20% goes to the government and 80% goes to the citizen. So B'nai Israel had already paid their fair share of uh, 430 years. 20% is 86 years. They gave Pao 86 years of very difficult labor. The other 344 years, they're technically allowed to keep for themselves. You hear this? Therefore, the Jews were able to leave Egypt knowing that they paid their 20% share of the slavery. Leave me alone, Pao, I gave you already, you do share. The Torah Haim is telling us that as a result of the butler's dream, Yosef was able to position Egyptian law in such a way that benefited the Jews who would be enslaved there in the future. And then the Torah Chaim asks, so what's the purpose of these arba kosot that we drink on Pesach? What's the purpose of these four cups of wine that we drink on Pesach? These four cups represent the discount we received, right? So every course we drink is 86 years that were taken off from the 430 years that we were supposed to be in Egypt. That's something to drink about, no? <laughs> That's a serious lechaim, ladies. Every course is another 86 years that we were spared from Pao's leadership from his tyranny. Question is, why do we have to use wine? We said earlier that the uh, a word kos equals 86. So the kos itself represents the 86 years that Hashem took off 
every time, cos, 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 cos. So it doesn't matter what we put into the cos because it's the cos itself that counts, not the contents of the cos. So why do we have to fill up our cosot with wine? The Torah Chaim answers this question by mentioning what the Ariya Kadosh Alava Shalom writes in his Sefer, Shar HaKavanot. The Ariya explains that the reason why the Jews had to be enslaved in Egypt was because it was a tikkun for Chet Adam HaRishon. It was a rectification of the sin of Adam and Chava. The reason you have to come to the Shiu was because of the sin of Adam HaRishon. In other words, everything is because of the original sin in Gan Eden. It all goes back to Bereshit, to the source. And what was the sin of Adam HaRishon? According to the Gemara, the forbidden fruit that Adam ate was grapes. So the Jews had to go down to Egypt and be there for 430 years in order to correct the sin of Adam eating the grapes from the Etz Haddat. But what happened? Like we said earlier, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us that discount and we left much earlier than planned because if we would have been enslaved to Paro for more than 86 years, we would have sunk to the lowest gates of Tuma, and we would have been stuck in Egypt forever. So how are we supposed to correct the sin of Adam Rishon if we left Egypt earlier than planned? If the decree was 430 years to correct the sin of Adam Rishon, but we left 344 years early, so how are we going to do the tikkun? The Ariya Kadosh explains that the wine that Adam Arishon drank in Gan Eden, Be'isu, we correct, we correct that sin on the night of Pesach by pouring the wine into the kos. And that's how we correct the sin of the yayin. That means that those extra 344 years that we weren't slaves in Egypt, slaving away. Those years are, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, fulfilled, so to speak, on the night of the Seder. How? By drinking the four kosot in a permissible way, which equals 344. 86 is kos times four is 344 because each cost, like we said, equals 86. Cost is 86 and 86 times four is 344. Ladies, every time you fill up your cost on the night of Pesach, you're not only commemorating the 86 year discount we received for each cost, but every cost is slowly but surely correcting all the avonot that were created as a result of Chet Adam Arishon. Listen to the words of the Torah Chaim. Lehasir zahomatam zahamat hanachash beyain. We're trying to remove the impurity of the snake, of the nachash that was done through wine, just as it says in the Gemara. Et she'achal Adam Arishon gefen haya. The tree that Adam ate from was a vine tree. It was a grape, it was grapes. And if you remember the story of Yosef, by the way, when Yosef revealed himself to his, revealed himself to his brothers, and, and then he asked his father to come down to Egypt, he sent gifts to Yaakov. What did he send Yaakov? What gift? The Pasuk says he sent him Yain Yashan. He sent his father old wine. And Chachamim explained that normally, as things age, they get worse, they rot, they decay. But with wine, the older it is, the better it tastes. You know why Yosef sent Yaakov Yain Yashan? Because Yosef was giving his father a siman, a sign. He was trying to tell his father the following, Abba, we're going to make the tikkun of the Yain Yashan, the old wine of Adam Rishon. Abba, the time has come to begin fixing the sin of the Yain Yashan. How much is the word Yain in Gematria? 70. 
And how much is the word yashan? It's 360. 360 and 70 is 430. Oh, that's the 430 years of slavery that the Jews had to endure in order to correct the sin of the Yaim Yashan. Yosef sent Yaakov a message, Abba, we're going to go down to Egypt to fulfill the gzera of a 430-year slavery because it's time to do the tikkun of Adam HaRishon. But since HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us a huge discount on this 430-year decree of the Yayin Yashan, it says, Lachen tiknu arba kosot al yayin. For this reason, Chachamim instituted that the four cups on Pesach should be filled with dafka wine. Now, the Ari Kadosh writes that when the Jewish people came down to Egypt, they had to correct five judgments against them. And those five judgments were connected the name Elohim, which also has five letters, interestingly. And the name Elohim, fascinatingly, also equals 86. So they were five judgments that had to be corrected. Five uh, uh, Elohims, so to speak, needed a tikkun. That's how the Ari comes to 430, because five times 86 is 430. But, says the Ari, since HaKadosh Baruch Hu sees the end result of something, HaKadosh Baruch Hu already saw that Am Yisrael is not going to be able to endure an extra second past those 86 years that they worked as slave labor, so to speak. If they would have stayed an extra day, they would have never come out. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu did a chesed with Am Yisrael, and after the first 86 years of hard labor, they were redeemed and they left Mitzrayim. And interestingly, by the way, when Moshe Rabbeinu came to take the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim, the Pasuk says, Velo shamu el Moshe. They didn't believe Moshe Rabbeinu. Why? Mikotze ruach. The Jewish people were so broken and they were so confused and downtrodden from the difficult slavery in Egypt, they couldn't believe Moshe Rabbeinu that the end of the slavery had finally come. He's telling them, and they're saying, ah, that's hard for us to believe. It says the Levariya, the word mikotzer, as a mikotzer ruach, the word mikotzer is equal to 430 in gematria. What does that tell us? In other words, it was hard for Bnei Yisrael to believe that the redemption had actually arrived because according to their tradition, they knew that they were supposed to be in Egypt for 430 years. They couldn't imagine that the time had come for them to be redeemed. Anyway, going back to here, I want to know what happened to those extra 344 years that we were supposed to be in Egypt that were discounted to us. The Lev Ariya, Lev Shalom, explains that after being redeemed from Egypt, the Jewish people were still going to experience four additional exiles. Each of those exiles was going to last a certain amount of years. Galut Bavel lasted 70 years. Our current Galut so far has lasted more than 2,000 years, unfortunately. So the Lev Ariyah shares with us an amazing, amazing Chidush. He says that those extra 344 years that were discounted to us in Egypt, they were divided among the four exiles. And each of those exiles are really... Keneged, 86 years of Egypt. I'm confusing you, but what does that mean? You see, in Galud Bavel, we were able to redeem ourselves from the 86 years of Egypt because we said, 
uh, every course is 86 years, right? The reduction was in groups of 86, 86, 86, 86, right? So in Galut Bavel, we were able to redeem ourselves from the 86 years of Egypt within a, a 70 year span. Each of the Galuyot lasted a certain amount of time and we're told that that time is fitting into the mold of the 86 years of Egypt. In other words, this 2,000 year long galut that we're experiencing is really calculated by Hashem ultimately as an 86 year long galut, believe it or not. How that works mathematically, we don't know because the calculations of time are in Shemaim. But the point is that the discount we received in Egypt so that we could leave early, that discount is incorporated into the four exiles. That's why the four kosot also represent the arba leshonot. Vehotseti, vehitzalti, vega'alti, velakachti. In actuality, we only left Egypt once. But these four Lashonot, Chachamim tell us, are connected the four discounts that we received from Hashem so that we'd be able to leave Egypt in the first place. But then Hashem was going to defer the payments within the structure of the other four exiles. Hence, says the Levariye, Vehotseti, that's Keneged Bavel, Galun Bavel. We had to go through that exile in order to compensate for the 86 years in Egypt that were discounted to us. Course number one. Veitzalti is keneged parasu madai. Vegaalti is keneged galut yavan. And velakachti is keneged the current galut that we're in, which is called galut edom. All these galuyot represent those 344 years that were discounted. That means that the four Lashonot of Geula isn't only referring to Yetziat Mitzrayim, but rather the future Galuyot and redemptions. And amazingly, the Lev Arye points out that whenever the Gemara talks about the years that the Jews were persecuted by the Goim, very interestingly, they refer to those years as Gzerat Shmad. Why is it referred to by that name? Because the word Shmad is equal to 344 in Gematria. And since those are the years that were discounted for B'nai Israel in Egypt, but they still have to be compensated for, therefore, whenever the Gentiles persecuted us or exiled us, it was called Gzerat Shmad. Chachamim knew that it's all part of those 344 years that we still have to make up for leaving Egypt early. These galuyot, these four exiles, are our payment towards the overall 430 years that we were destined to be in Egypt. Now ladies, what we're learning tonight, it's astounding on many levels. But what does this all have to do with the Korban Pesach that I began speaking about at the beginning of the Shiur. By now you all forgot the beginning of the Shiur already <laughs> because you were so engrossed in the gematrias and the deep concepts, the butler's dream, the Arba Kosot, 86, 86, and all the numbers. But bottom line, what does this all have to do with the Korban Pesach that was taken on the 10th of Nisan tied to the bedposts and then slaughtered. What does this all have to do with the miracle that took place on that Shabbat all those years ago where Hashem saved the Jews from the Egyptians who wanted to kill us because we were going to slaughter their God? So let's go back to the Torah Chaim and see what he says. He says, uh, by the way, this is the reason why Hashem has the Jews to take the Korban Pesach four days prior to its slaughtering. You know why? Listen to this Lashon. In the merit of taking the Korban Pesach four days before the Shechita, four days before they slaughtered it, before the Geula from Egypt, Arba'a keneged Arba'a. 
these four days were going to be connected the four exiles that were coming up in the future. So taking the Korban Pesach four days early was also one of the ways that the Jews were able to receive that 80% discount and, and leave from Egypt to preempt their gzera. And how did we get four-fifths removed from the original gzera of 430 years? By taking the Korban Pesach four days early with tremendous mesirut nefesh because the Egyptians wanted to kill us for taking their God. Says the Torah Chaim, Ki mitzvah zu gedola hayta. The mitzvah of the Korban Pesach was so great and the mesirut nefesh that we displayed in those four days was so great. Veruya lomar negda chalkei sheibud shelo nishta'abadu ela letzaref chumram. Which means these four days helped to effectuate that 80% discount. It was a tremendous mesirut nefesh what we did. And the Torah Chaim points out that the main miracle, by the way, happened day number one of the four days. And that's why it's called Shabbat Hagadol. That's the day where the Egyptians realized what the Jews were going to do with their sheep and they were going to kill us. After that day, the Egyptians already realized they had no choice and they became accustomed to the reality that their deity was going to be destroyed and slaughtered. So it turns out that according to the Torah Chaim, Shabbat HaGadol isn't only about commemorating the day where we took the sheep and Hashem made a miracle and saved us from the Egyptians. The schut of those four days before Pesach, which only happened in Mitzrayim, and never did it happen after that, where we took the sheep and tied it to the bedpost, those four days of Mesirut Nefesh helped to create the discount that Hashem gave us where we left earlier than schedule. Hashem was telling us, listen, I'm going to defer the payment to the future exiles. I'm going to do that for you. But right now, this second, you have to do something in order to activate the discount. So I'm going to create a situation where for four days, you have to be willing to die. That's what Mesirut Nefesh means. And whenever an Egyptian asks you why you're taking the sheep, you have to explain that it's because you were commanded by me and that you're willing to die for this cause. So Shabbat HaGadol represents the beginning of the discount that we received. And because of that great miracle, we left Egypt earlier than planned. Now that's something to celebrate, ladies. And guess what? All these secrets were already made known to Yosef HaTzadik through the dream of the Sarah Mashke. Yosef knew the secret of the Arba Kosot in that dream and what it meant for Am Yisrael. You know, many Jews, especially Ashkenazim, have a minhag, a custom of placing a fifth kos on the table that's referred to as kos shel Eliyahu Hanavi, Zachor Latov. We pour wine into a big kos, big uh, gavia, a goblet, and we leave it in the center of the table. The fifth cup represents the final geula. So according to what we learned tonight, the four kosot, we said, represent the discount that we received in Egypt, meaning the 344 years that we weren't slaves to Pao in Egypt. And we still have to pay those 344 years, and we've been paying our uh, dues throughout the last four exiles. And Chachamim say, before Mashiach comes, those 344 years have to be paid in full. So now we can understand why so many of us fill up that fifth cup of wine because kos, which we said is equal to 86 times five, which is the fifth cup, is equal to 430. In other words, 
Once our debt of the 430 years is paid up, then Eliyahu Hanavi Zakhulatov can reveal himself to us and we could start singing all those Mashiach songs. <laughs> right? So that fifth cause is very important. It's the metaphorical fulfillment of the 430 years and that final bill that's paid in full. Now, why did I choose to share this lesson with you as you enter in sh into Shabbat HaGadol? Because I want you to understand and to appreciate the chesed Hashem. Notice how much Hashem loves us. In reality, we were supposed to be in Egypt for 430 years. But Hashem redeemed us early enough so that we shouldn't fall into the klipot of Mitzrayim and remain there forever. And we daven that this fourth galut that's lasted over 2,000 years should come to an end because in this galut we experienced the Spanish Inquisition and various expulsions from one country to the next, from one city to the next, from one town to the next. In this Galut, we experienced the Gzerot of Tach Vetat, coupled with hundreds, if not thousands, of pogroms. In this Galut, we suffered the hatred of Europe by the hands of the Nazi regime. I don't think there's been a Galut quite as devastating as Galut Edom. And we want all these troubles in Am Yisrael already to come to an end. We want to experience the final Geulah. The Iratzon, that when we fill that fifth cup of wine at the Seder table this coming Chag, that Hashem should count it as the final accounting of our dues paid. Amen. And may we merit to see Eliyahu Hanavi Zachor Latov as he proclaims Mashiach's arrival vivaser lanu besorot tovot, yeshuot venechamot. I wish you all a Shabbat Hagadol Shalom, or like I said in the Ashkenazic lingo, a good Shabbos Hagadol. And may we feel the inspiration of Hashem's chesed and rachamim upon us as we proceed onward to the week of Pesach and Be'ezat Hashem to the final Geula. Amen Ken. Yeah, that's all.